Phil's presentation was very good, and it and it it it, it, it highlights the the actual history that has been going on for the last 50 years, which is deregulation, desovereignization, uh, increased corporations, banks, and the whole system. You know, and it has been growing and growing and, and taking over the world. And now it's going to go away. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> it's all going to go away because it, it doesn't work. So anyhow, um, so tonight is a very special night. Um, I'm going to uh, interweave two, two fundamental themes. One is the current situation coming out, coming into and out of the 19th um, uh, 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 Congress of the Communist Party of China. And the second is, is the, uh, is the, uh, uh, the issue of Hamilton and LaRouche. And so, so what I want to do is to communicate to you a better sense of the significance excuse me, of Hamilton and, and Lyndon LaRouche from the standpoint of the Belt and Road Initiative since the early 1700s proposal by Leibniz to bring a bridge between Europe and China for global development. And this, uh, and that, in the strategic context of, of, of human physical economic history. Now, what I mean by human physical economic history, what I mean is, contrary to what people might think, whatever policy makers might think, or whatever anybody might think, we do not live in a world devoid of the necessity to develop from one economic platform we must either figure out what breakthroughs in our understanding of nature and how to apply those breakthroughs to go to the next platform or we will eventually collapse. In earlier times you would have a society collapse or in our current global system the entire human species collapses. So I'll start with the experience of a young man uh, in the during the 60s, 1960s. His name is Xi Jinping, who from fifth, from the age of 15 to 22 did manual labor on a collective farm in the poor interior of China. So I want you to imagine this individual who did not have secondary education at the, uh, because of the, 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 <coughs> the Cultural Revolution. I already later went on to study um, uh, chemical engineering. But nonetheless, this was an individual who had to work, work as a lowest level of, 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 of activity in the society for seven years. And think about how this might look to him. Okay, now, and from here I, I link uh, Xi's experience to the Leibnizian genius of Hamilton. And so Hamilton's genius did not merely lie in his proposal to fund the Revolutionary War debt and turn it into circulating money or his proposal for a national bank and credit system. We often miss the purpose of these things when we talk about them. The conception that Hamilton had for which all of this was designed was to bring into being a completely new and revolutionary conception that was implicit in, in Leibniz before, but it, this is a completely revolutionary conception which today would not be, in the way most people think about it, is not revolutionary. It's called the development of manufacturers. The development of manufacturers. Okay, now. Um, okay. 
Okay. Okay. Um, The essence of, of Hamilton's conception. Okay, saying this means nothing to most people, but it is truly revolutionary. And except for those promoting the Belt and Road, the Chinese leadership, and currently those steeped in LaRouche's science of economics, and also those of the oligarchical leadership of the world that is dead sense against this system, this core conception of the development of manufacturers is not really understood. The essence of Hamilton's conception is that creating facilities to produce technologies and products that could increase the productivity per farm worker per hectare, human beings could be freed up to do a multiplicity of new things, including different kinds of manufacturing, uh, a greater division of labor, uh, creative activities, educational activities, scientific activities, research activities, city building, and much more. But all of that has to be supported by an agricultural base. And if you cannot free people up from working the land, then you can't do any of those things. So now let's go to where food is produced. A family, an agriculture unit works the land. In order to work the land, the individuals of that unit must have enough to eat to be able to survive, to be able to work. To increase the amount of food produced without modern industrial civilization, the number of people working in the fields must increase if you're going to increase the amount of food. There are boundaries beyond which production cannot increase. There are soil boundaries and, and quality of land boundaries. There are boundaries in terms of implements used in agriculture, whether one is only using a digging stick or a metal hole or a plow or draft animals makes a huge difference in the amount being produced. Availability of water and weather are also boundaries. If the farmers are looted too much by robbers, lords, priests, or and or armies, the farmers decrease and so does production if famine ensues. If not otherwise, if, the, if that famine is not otherwise caused by droughts, floods, and hordes of locusts. All of history preceding Hamilton is the history of food insecurity. It's very important. The history of empires, the history of invasions, the history of raids by nomads, of Vikings, of politics is all based on securing, stealing, or having title to, or somehow securing the product of the farmer, whether that be a serf, a slave, a peon, a, a whatever, in whatever form. That's the, that was the basis of history. There's only so much surplus, and there are limits to what physically human labor can produce. Without manufacturers changing and dramatically increasing the productivity of agriculture per unit, or per, per person, and ultimately uh, mechanization, the limit of food production is bounded by the physical labor, the phys sheer physical calories expended by animals and humans, period. This is very important. This is a conception that does not exist anymore in our society. Okay, the landlord who lives in the town, or it could be the lord in the castle, or the, or the monastery that owns the surrounding land, and it could be a Christian monastery or a Buddhist monastery. Only have leisure to, at the expense of the farmer, the toil of the, of the worker. Then there are bigger lords, and so on. If a lord or king cannot extract enough to cover their luxuries, there is always a neighbor or a kingdom next door for which an, for which an army is needed uh, to, to, to take what in take what cannot be made, what not, cannot be produced. 
But then that army requires more food to, to maintain. So you have to take more. Other than the leisure afforded to a few, what is the notion of human freedom here? Is it the freedom to loot your neighbor? Is it the freedom of the serf to escape and become an outlaw rather than a farmer and be a looter? Or is it the promised freedom in the afterlife? This is what Hamilton addresses in his report to Congress on the subject of manufacturers in 1791. This is absolutely revolutionary. And with that, he created the Society for the Establishment of Useful Manufacturers. Okay. Hamilton, with a few others like Gouverneur Morris, took the lead to create the United States as Constitution so that a system of government existed to promote the development of manufacturers in a population that was free enough and cultured enough to assimilate the development of manufacturers. This was prohibited by the slave system in the South. In Hamilton, everything is grounded in the goal of our ever-increasing national productivity rooted in scientific and technological progress. That was Hamilton's conception of freedom. It is not the romantic personal freedom of doing whatever one feels like or the freedom to enslave people to toil the, on the land or elsewhere so one can enjoy a decadent, unpurposeful, leisurely life off the sweat of the labor of others. That was not Hamilton's concept of freedom. Without Hamilton's concept of freedom and the continuing progress in the development of manufacturers, there is no real freedom. Okay. Um, I read this before to people. And um, and I'll, I'll just quickly read this section. Part of this. I read, I read a longer section of it um, to people. But. Okay, so this is during the, uh, the convention and, 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 and um, over the fight over the issue of slavery in the, in the, in the convention uh, for the Constitution of the United States. And this is Governor Morris who actually led the fight with Hamilton against the slavery. And he said, Upon which, what principle is it that slaves shall be computed in the representation? Are they men? Then make them citizens. Let them vote. Are they property? Why then is no other property included? The houses of Philadelphia are worth more than the wretched slaves that cover the rice swamps of South Carolina. The admission of slaves into the representation would fairly explain comes to this, that the inhabitants of Georgia and South Carolina who goes to the coast of Africa and in defiance of the most sacred laws of humanity tears away his fellow creatures from their dearest connections and damns them to the most cruel bondage, shall have more votes in, in a government instituted for the protection of the rights of mankind than the citizens of Pennsylvania or, or New Jersey. Okay. Slavery is a nefarious institution, the curse of heaven on the states where, where it prevails. Compare the free regions of the middle states where a rich and noble cultivation marks the prosperity and happiness of people with the misery and poverty that overspread the barren wastes of Virginia, Maryland, and other states having slaves. Travel through the whole continent and behold the prospect continually varying with the appearance and disappearance of slavery. Okay, so, so, um, So th th this is very important because, because I want to look briefly at this. People, this is completely whitewashed in American history. Even in our own organization, it's whitewashed. And i got to get to this, okay? Jefferson, 
the great founder, Madison, the great founder, Monroe, the great hero of the American uh, 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 the War of 1812. And every president since 1801 to 1861, with the one exception of John Quincy Adams, bitterly opposed Hamilton's conception of the development of manufacturers and most of all, aggressively promoted the expansion of slavery. And they were all slaveholders too. Huh? They were all slaveholders as well. And they were all slaveholders. <coughs> slaveholders. Jefferson Madison. Oh yeah. Yeah. This is even true of Henry Clay, credited with coining the term the American system. As a consequence, the full implementation of Hamilton's ideas had to wait until Lincoln, which in the four short years, four plus few months short years, a complete industrial transformation occurred in the United States using Hamilton's methods, the greenbacks, the promotion of manufacturers directed by the government under an emergency uh, system. They completely transformed America from being uh, the North, that is, the northern part of America, to the first major industrial power in the world. They did that in four years uh, under wartime conditions using Hamilton's methods and using the, all of the tools that Hamilton described in the beginning of the country. However, within 30 years after Lincoln's death, the slave system was back in the form of the KKK and Jim Crow, and the lost cause of slave power in the South was fully enshrined in the nostalgic, romantic memory of, of, the, of the victims of the, civil, of the Civil War. The second Ku Klux Klan, was born at the White House of the United States under the liberal president Woodrow Wilson, who premiered the initial film, Hollywood film, Birth of a Nation, which was a recruitment film for the second Klan at the White House. And so was born also Hollywood. Jefferson's agrarian concept of slavery is still very popular. It's very popular in the environmentalist movement of today and in the state rights populism of today where Lincoln is the number one devil. Big government is the enemy. Big government is Hamilton. Jefferson and Madison completely opposed any government investment in developing manufacturing. Okay, so, so without progress in the development of manufacturers, the society will tend to degenerate. Why is that? First, over the issue of who gets or deserves the surplus, when the surplus should be agreed to be deployed to increase the entire full potential of production and the development of the future. When you don't have that conception, then whatever is produced becomes a free-for-all. Well, without that orientation, you live in a zero-sum game, which is where we are now, in which the surplus is taken for granted. And everybody loses and declines morally in the struggle for, their, for theirs against everyone else for the limited surplus. Not only wasting the future, but thereby losing direction and purpose for the society. The wealthy say the poor are poor because they are lazy and stupid, and for that they deserve to be poor. And the poor say the rich are not sharing the wealth. There's no harmony. It is the rich versus the poor and the middle class. It is the middle class versus the rich and the poor. And it is the poor versus the rich and the middle class. This is culturally reinforced by a culture of romanticism, of the ego, of the individual. 
which romantic culture has oppressed us historically. Whether in the Middle Ages, whether in European colonialism, or in today's conservative neo-feudalists or, or so-called neo, or, or neoliberals. The psychological glue that holds this together from the days of slavery to the lost cause to today's anti-development perspective, whether it be environmentalism or anti-big government, is the anti-social conception of the individual in our culture. This is the romantic desire, for instance, of a slave overseer wanting to become a slave master, as an example. Or the self-conception of a mercenary knight, a romanticized killer, no different than in the Middle Ages or in today's Hollywood movies. Or the romantic crusades against the Holy Land in order to plunder and loot. Or today's romantic crusade against the axis of evil to plunder and loot. It was only in 1933, after the collapse, that FDR restored Hamilton in the second industrialization, which occurred from 1933 on through, on through 1945, prior to the war and during the war. But it was up to the FBI, deployed by Wall Street and the British, like Mueller today, to sabotage the, the continuation of Hamilton after FDR. This could be hit. And uh, the latest news I have is that uh, Trump may declassify the, the 30,000 documents on the JFK assassination, which should be interesting to see if, if the FBI is hurt on that one. So, <coughs> so let me go quickly to LaRouche. What LaRouche has done uh, is to place the core concept of the development of manufacturers into an irrefutable science, the science of physical economics. Until LaRouche, Hamilton's ideas were not backed up by an actual body of, of, of science. Today, any society or nation can plan its physical economic future based on LaRouche's physical economics. LaRouche's proposals over 40 years and forecasts over 60 years are based on this science. Now, essentially, LaRouche's economics, which you can discover for yourself, and I encourage you to do that, starts with a society and a culture and a government <coughs> which promotes the cultural development of its citizens in order that a potential is created for individual geniuses to emerge, like Hamilton. These geniuses are required for making discoveries and realizing their economic application. This all, however, when doing so, it all requires an increase in one, the division of labor. Now, division of labor means that when you go to produce something more complicated, you need a division of parts and you need a much more division of labor and then those parts need another division of labor. So you have to extend the division of labor. So you, now the biggest problem with extending the division of labor is that exists if a large part of the population of the world lives in squalor and are not educated and are barely surviving or are working the fields and are uh, in a manual way which a large part of, the, part of the population of the world still does and therefore their potential to be part of a, of a, of a developed division of labor does not exist. So creating an increased division of labor is indispensable to increasing the wealth of the world or increasing the wealth of a nation, increasing the productive power. And if you can't do that, then you're not going to increase the wealth. So what they have done in the last, what Phil was talking about, is reversed it. Reversed it so that we have less of a division of labor, uh, potential for, less potential for a division of labor by impoverishing whole populations that used to be skilled used to be highly skilled people. Two, you need infrastructure to connect everything. Three, you need an increased standard of living. All of these are necessary to connect the farmer to the manufacturer, to the mines, M-I-N-E-S, to the urban centers. There's somewhere between a 10,000 to 100,000 fold difference in the, the power of one individual to produce food between the most primitive form of agriculture, just using a digging stick, to the modern mechanized uh, culture.
So the food is grown on the land, but it's not. It's, it's actually created, the inputs are created elsewhere. And that, has, that is what has freed people to be more than just living the life that Xi Jinping lived between the ages of 15 and 22. Now, what is the Belt and Road Initiative? It is precisely carrying this out on a global scale. That's what the Belt and Road Initiative is. This is Hamilton, and it's also LaRue. Now, let's take a look at a, 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 one of the views of the oligarchy towards all of this. Many of you have been heard about the limits to growth movement, about the population reduction movement, about all the stuff about the, you know, we're over we're overproducing, we're overconsuming, we are overgrowing, you know, we are polluting, we are doing all these things, and this is really bad, you know, we're way beyond our carrying capacity, blah, blah, blah. Now, if you, if you go to these people, the experts, the scientists, and all of this, and a lot of them also overlap with the environmentalists, they're saying that the Earth's maximum population should be uh, between 500 million and 2 billion. And the difference between 500 million and 2 billion is depending upon how much industry is allowed, how much uh, non, uh, how much industrial activity is allowed. In the 500 million, you can pretty much assume that there is none. In the 2 billion, you can assume that there's some. So you're looking at the oligarchy projecting a world that is primarily pre-industrial. Maybe at, with some debate over how much industry. Okay? So you know they understand the idea of the development of manufacturers as their mortal enemy. Now that's not the average person that goes to college, that's not your average environmentalist who thinks this way, per se. But this is the deep, deep highest level of the oligarchy. They see the development of manufacturers as the greatest threat to their existence. Why? Because it never ends. You go from one platform, and a hundred years later, you're at another platform, and another hundred years later, you're at, you're at a galactic platform, you're at a solar platform system platform, now you're at a galactic platform, you know, it never ends. And once you start it, it never ends. And because we are a, a planet, and we now have to utilize all the people in the planet in a productive uh, way, then whether we, that, that is the reality. We have to bring in people out of poverty. But not because we, 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 you know, we feel sorry for them because they're poor. <laughs> no, because it's absolutely necessary. You have to do it for, the, for your own future, for the future of your children. You know, it's not about how you feel about it. It's, it has to be done. And by the way, when they say 500 million to 200, this is what they mean by the code word sustainable. What they mean is what is the population level such that we can permanently sustain an oligarchy? That's, that's what they mean by the word sustainable. Okay, that's, the, that's what they mean. That's the word, the word sustainable means that. Okay. Now, now, I'll fast forward you into the 19th uh, con uh, uh, the 19th uh, Congress of the Communist Party, which is still going on. And Xi Jinping gave a three and a half hour presentation, which was somewhat uh, amazing. I don't think any Communist Party secretary has ever done that before, or come close to that. And why would he give a three and a half hour presentation to, to, to the Communist Party and to the uh, people that were watching. You know, I mean, the whole country was watching this presentation. Um, and the theme, the basic, the basic injunction that he made to the, to the people there who are the leadership of China is, your purpose 
is to promote the prosperity and happiness of the people. That's why you exist. You don't exist to make money. You don't exist to be good, you know, to be this and that. You know, to take your money outside. <laughs> you know, whatever. You exist. Okay. And this vision of the, uh, 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 of the Belt and Road is multi-generational. It's not something that's just getting started. It's, it's a vision that, like I said earlier, it gets started and it doesn't stop. It involves the whole world because we all share a common destiny, as Xi Jinping says. And from the science of physical economics and from Hamilton's conception, the division of labor required to this, as I said, requires the upgrading of all the poor. For the upgrading of the poor is the source of the expansion of the development of manufacturers and expansion of the development of labor on which uh, division of labor, on which the future production, production depends. And that means every, everybody in the world. There's no exception. So they have a vision to eliminate poverty and as they define it in China, by 2020, to be a moderately prosperous nation, modernized by 2030, and by 2050, be completely modernized. So, that's quite, that's why there's now a freak out. And I mean, the freak out is Xi Jinping is now the most powerful guy in the world. They all say now he is the emperor, he's the dictator, he's the Stalin. He is restricting the freedoms of the Chinese people. Well, you're damn straight. And I'll tell you why. Okay? When you become a middle class person and you come out of poverty, you have a certain amount of leisure. Right? You don't want these people to become decadent from the leisure and the freedom to become decadent. They need freedom. But the freedom has to be harnessed. And they have to be given a vision of the future from, for which their freedom is needed. You're not going to allow Lady Gaga and all of that to come into China. Right? Oh, that's repressive. <laughs> that's repressive. We can't, we can't allow, we can't. They won't let Lady Gaga in. They won't let so-and-so in. They won't let all the porn films in. They won't let all, all you know, everything, everything going in there. No. They're being repressive. We thought we could corrupt the new middle class of China. And he, with his vision of, an, of the future, is robbing us of our power to corrupt the emerging middle class of China. That's why they're freaked out. Okay? Now, but Xi Jinping is not alone. He has a, he has a friend. Okay. <laughs> he has a friend. And his friend had something to say at Sochi and, and um, at at Baldheim at uh, Valdai and, and uh, the Valdai discussion forum in Sochi, and uh, okay, at the Valdai discussion forum is, is Vladimir Putin. And there were 130 participants from three, uh, 33 countries, mostly Western. And Putin uh, laid out the task of finding outside of the box solutions to the questions that the future is posing for us at this moment. And he had, uh, he said that we need a new international order and global governance system if peace is to be secured. We can only have a shared future. There can be no separate futures for us, at least not in the modern world. He reminded people, so the responsibility for ensuring that this world is conflict-free and prosperous lies with the entire international community. Uh, 
And he said the Middle East exemplifies this dynamic where some players have tried to reshape and reformat the region to their liking and impose upon it a foreign development model through externally orchestrated coups or simply by force of arms. And by the way, the Chinese are saying they have, they, they're, not, they're not copying any, any other model. They, they have their own uh, model. This is what Putin says, you have to have your own model. Some of our colleagues are doing everything they can to make the world, make the chaos in the region permanent. Some think it is possible to manage this chaos. And so forth. So Putin is, is, is essentially intervening <coughs> and, and, and then following Valdai. This is very significant. In, in, in Sochi, they had arranged to have a youth conference, a festival of youth, so that when he finished at, at, at Valdai, he went over to the Conference of Youth, where there are 25,000 young people from 188 countries. Uh, so, and each day this week is dedicated to a macro region, uh, America, Asia, Oceania, Europe, <coughs> okay, and, and the Middle East. So, they brought in 25,000 young people from all over the world to this conference. Why? Because they're the future. So, the, so this, is, this thing is, 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 is with, 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 with China and Russia, it's long term. It's not short term. They're not looking for short term advantages. They're going for a long term system because you cannot survive on this planet anymore unless you make, unless you come to an understanding that the various nations of the world are going to work together. You are not going to be able to survive. And that's the reality. And so, um, so now we come to to our, our initiatives, our mobilizations. Okay, we the the, the the international movement, especially the U.S. component of the international movement, are in a are in a fundamental battle to essentially remove the impediment some of the impediments that are blocking the ability of the President of the United States to act in the interests of the American people. There are so many obstacles, like the ones that Phil described, which are on the economic and corporate and so forth. There's so many obstacles of corruption that, that prevent uh, an elected official like who was elected against the system to be able to act in, in, in the interests of the American people. And perhaps one of the most important of those is the police state apparatus centered in the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. So this dossier that we put out is now drawing blood. It isn't that that people are taking the information on the dossier and necessarily using it, but it's, it's drawing blood. Because it's creating an environment, or at least among some key people, that you've got to deal with this if you're going to survive. If Trump, the Trump administration is going to survive and do anything, they've got, to, they've got to take care of this problem. Unlike other presidents who were assassinated and, and the assassination was protected by the FBI or they were, they were targeted or or they were prevented from reaching that position by frame-ups and, and other covert activities by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Now, the latest developments are quite incredible. Mueller is now coming under attack from many different quarters. Nineteen congressmen are calling for congressional hearings to, quote, bring Mueller out of the shadows. He's, he's got a hundred or so investigators working for them. Nobody knows where they're going, what they're doing. They're, you know, they're going even so far as to, as to uh, uh, surveil your pets. You know, that's how far they're going. Um, it's, it's, and, and, so this is very important, that he has to be held accountable. And the question is, is he biased? Is he really acting 
uh, without uh, 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 bias, or is he, is he part of a political witch hunt? That, that's what they want to determine. And that's what the congressional hearing, if it, if it were to be had, would, were, to, were to be had. Now, then you have this very uh, interesting development where these two uh, employees from Fusion GPS who were involved in circulating the, the Christopher Steele dossier were, were brought before the U.S. Congress and they pled the Fifth Amendment, which means that they were protecting themselves from criminal. They were, they were, when you take the Fifth Amendment, it means you, you are not... Yeah. You need to explain who Chris, Christopher Steele is. A lot of people may not know. I'll get to that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, the Christopher Steele thing is very significant. This guy was tasked to do the research on Trump for the Russian connection. Now, who is he? He was the desk officer of British intelligence, MI6, in Moscow for almost a decade. Does anybody, that's the equivalent of the CIA station chief. It's a high rank. You have, to, you have to understand, that is not a low level position. That is a very high level position. What was it? So any dossier that he would be associated with would be considered highly credible just on that basis alone. Because he was in Moscow. British intelligence is very considered very sophisticated and very and, 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 and does know where all the dirt is. Okay. So, so the fact that the people who were hiring hiring him. Now the question is, was the FBI? Well, he was now earlier. He had worked with the FBI in the. Um, in the case of the Olympic uh, Olympic Committee, where they excluded all these Russians, this, it was an anti-Russian operation involved in the Olympic Committee. He, he was the one who did the work for the FBI on that. So he was already long before this. Before this, he was already very close to the FBI before he was picked. So not only was he re a retired MI6, but he was he was he was already working close with the FBI on another on other issues. So here, this guy does this completely fake dossier. Now the question is, was that dossier, which was the dossier, given uh, support by British intelligence? If it was, then British intelligence was in, was involved in authenticating the dossier, and was the dossier used to to go to the federal? Uh, surveillance court to get the uh, the order to surveil Trump and his and his colleagues and his campaign. If it was, then according to many people, this this requires a grand jury investigation into all of this because there's a lot of crimes that would have been committed in all of that. So this is very important. Then it turns out that some Samantha Powers has been implicated in about 265 um, uh, unmaskings, which are illegal. She claims that it was done under her name. Most of them were done under her name without her, without her knowing it. So what is, she, what is that all about? And then there's a, a move to disbar Comey from the New York uh, bar for lying to Congress, which he did. Now, if you add to that the, uh, the possibility that next week the 30,000 pages of the, of, of the assassination uh, surrounding the assassination of John Kennedy were to come out, 30,000 documents, not 30,000 pages. Uh, now, whether anything will be in, that, in, in those documents relating that will open any doors to reviving and, uh, an understanding or overturning the the um, the um, the accepted version of Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, I don't know, but that would have a big if it, if there is, even if it's mi marginal, that would have a big um, e effect on these on the confidence and credibility of, of the people who have been running the country ever since, and who have essentially wanted to maintain these documents under wraps 
during this whole period of time. That is, a, even if it's marginal, it would have a huge impact on, on this. <coughs> and then, finally, you have the visit of Donald Trump to Asia. And on, starting on November 3rd, he will be in Japan. I believe he will be in, then he will go to South Korea. Then he'll be two days in China meeting with Xi Jinping. Then he'll go to Vietnam for the uh, for the apex summit, and he'll have to, an opportunity to meet with Putin and to have another meeting with Xi Jinping plus other leaders. And then he will go from there to the Philippines for the uh, another summit, Asian summit. And then he will go from there to Hawaii. So this is a 10-day tour. It's his second tour outside of the United States. And um, <coughs> this could have a very, very, very important uh, impact on the world. Um, how this plays out, we don't know. But there is, there is, there is emanating from, from the administration some very contradictory responses. Um, from Tillerson and Mattis, there's been a um, an quasi-anti Belt and Road response related to working with India against the Belt and Road uh, around the Pakistan thing, and then the State Department has issued a formal a formal a formal letter. Uh, in support of China's work with Pakistan and in the corridor. So this is all, it's all very unclear how this is all going to play out. But the, the Belt and Road is, 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 is moving very rapidly. And still most of Congress has no idea that it exists. Most of the members of Congress have no idea, the U.S. Congress have no idea that it exists. And I, I don't know how many members of the of the, of the uh, parliament here in Canada would know about it. But that's, it's moving very fast. So, I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic, um, cautiously optimistic that, that, that the process, the, 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 the momentum and, and the direction is, is moving. Uh, we, have, we had some very interesting comments from Trump, which are very cryptic, but they are Interesting, nonetheless, he, he made a comment on Puerto Rico saying, there goes the debt, you're going to have to wipe that out. And then there was a huge back, you know, attempt to push it back among, among Wall Street and the press and, and some of the people in this government. And then uh, he met with Cyprus, who is known to be a Trump hater, the uh, Greek uh, prime minister. And he talked about reducing Greek's debt. So you have to ask yourself, and Greece, while Greece is being real royally screwed by the, uh, by the, by the deal that they went through, um, nonetheless they are working, beginning to work very closely with China. Piraeus is becoming, uh, being rebuilt as a port, and the Chinese, uh, and Greece has saying that they will play a major role as a, as, a, as a mediating point, one of the mediating points between Europe and Asia. So their whole view is starting to shift. And a lot of European countries are lining up. And you have political instability in Germany of the extreme nature. You had uh, Jeremy Corbyn come to Europe and address um, the, the European Union on a responsible way to have uh, a fair uh, disengagement of Europe, of, Inc, of Great Britain from Europe in a manner that is, that is not detrimental to Europe or to, to Great Britain. And he's presenting himself as the, the new prime minister to, in waiting. And he said that, you know, he doesn't want Great Britain to be an offshore haven for, uh, uh, turn into an offshore haven to go against the world. And he said that, um, and then two of his enemies have come out saying he will be the next prime minister. One of them is uh, Mandelson, and the other is a Milibank. These are his deadly enemies who are now saying that they that he has to tweak it a little bit. You know, they have to 
say that. He's <laughs> tweak it a little bit. And we, while he's saying that we will do a radical, anti, you know, socialist agenda, we're not going to back off from that. And what he means by socialism, he means an end to privatization and end to the, you know, an end to all the stuff that we're talking about. Socialist politics. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so this is very. So he's in the wings to become the prime minister of Great Britain, and that is now. Now, if Millibank and Mandelson, who created Tony Blair, Mandelson created Tony Blair, are saying this, uh, then, then it means that he's gained tremendous support inside, inside Great Britain, to the point that, that were there an election, they're saying he, he would have a landslide at this point, because of everything that's happening to Great Britain. And so this definitely, not that, not that uh, everything that, uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn is necessarily agree with everything, but the point is, is that he represents a different, a very different perspective than, than the neoliberal perspective. And, <coughs> and, and, and so, he's, so he's already meeting with European leaders to, to, to discuss what he will do when he's Prime Minister of Great Britain. This is revolutionary. This is uh, unheard of. This is an end of this this is what I mean by the coming end of this whole thing that Phil was talking about, which is, which is coming to an end. It's, it, ha it has to come to an end. You cannot have a human race function under those, under those uh, 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 situations. So I'm, there's a lot going on. I'm going to stop there and open it up uh, for people.